Good evening and welcome to all who are attending our sixth electronic board meeting this semester. Um, this meeting is now called to order. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Here. Mr. Lavalley? Here. Mr. Lundberg? Here. Mrs. Reynolds? Here. Mr. Temby? Here. Thank you. I would like to invite all of us to um, join Colonel Harding in the Pledge of, Allegi Pledge of Allegiance this evening. Please join. Thank you, Mrs. Reynolds. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Colonel Harding. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Moving on to agenda item 2A. Mrs. Dodd, are there any updates to the agenda? There were updates to the agenda and the board was notified of these today. Thank you. Members of the board, are there any items you wish to move from the consent agenda? Hearing none, are there any items to be added to the agenda? Hearing none from the board, I would like to ask us to please consider moving item 9B, that's resolution 21120, approval of the modified Board of Education discretionary bu budget for fiscal year 2020-2021 prior to 7A, which is the resolution 20720, approval of budget adoption for fiscal year 2021. If there are no concerns with that, may we have a motion to approve the agenda? <clears throat> I move the agenda. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Lundberg? Aye. Mrs. Reynolds? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. Thank you all. Tonight's board quote is given, us to, given to us by Ms. Cloninger. So take it away, Ms. Cloninger. Thank you. Um, the quote that I chose today was by Helen Keller. And it says the highest result of education is tolerance. And I just wanted to say a couple things about that. Um, as I chose this board, board quote, I was thinking of uh, kind of everything that's going on in the world and, and uh, the long meeting that we had last um, on the 4th. And um, I just wanted to be really clear that tolerance does not mean acceptance. It is a fair objective and permissive attitude toward those whose opinions, beliefs, practices, racial or ethical origins, etc., differ differ from one's own, the freedom from bigotry. And I feel like um, it was pretty apropos. And I just wanted to say I am grateful for uh, that. Anyway, I don't want to go on to more, but that's why I chose it. Sorry, guys, <laughs> that was me. I was wondering why Ms. Cortez wasn't responding to me. It's because nobody could hear me. Sorry about that. We're going to move on to agenda item four and public comments. Mrs. Cortez, do we have anyone signed up to speak to the board this evening? We do have individuals signed up this evening. Thank you, Ms. Cortez. At this time, the board welcomes the comments of our community members. For electronic meetings, members of the public have written comments with no more than 400 words approximately three minutes and submitted these ahead of time. These comments must not contain profanity, must not reference student names, and must not defame an individual's or an individual by name. This is Allison Cortez, Director for Communication, will read the public's comments. The board greatly values all comments from the public, but in order to adhere to board policy and accomplish the work already on the agenda, the board will not respond this evening. Our first comment, making sure I was unmuted, sorry. Uh, my fir our first comment is from Mary Tuck. My name is Mary Tuck and I'm a District 20 mother and a business owner whose taxes help pay District 20 expenses. 
I co-own several martial arts academies here in the Pikes Peak area, one of which services mostly District 20 and its people. This is important because I have direct access to the thoughts of hundreds of people and even teachers who are part of District 20. Also important because of my own observations as an educator myself. First, my own children simply need to go back to in-person learning if they are to learn anything at all. My two kids did complete 95% of the assigned work because I made them, but did they actually learn anything? I would conclude that they did not learn much, if any, during the last two to three months of the school year. I personally have tripled my own work hours to serve our students and customers. Our metrics are telling us learning results have gone down by 65% in just three months. I have heard this is also a similar scenario with most District 20 teachers and students that they worked much harder and longer, but are not getting anywhere close to the same results as before COVID. I have also heard that the teachers are being told they will have an extra class added to their schedule starting next year with no added compensation. Really? This is just a bad idea. They will get burned out and either provide subpar learning experiences or they could just quit, causing the district to lose great teachers. This needs to be reconsidered. Please do more to take care of our teachers and to open the schools back up for our kids and our community sanity. We have to stop living in fear and just start living. Thank you for your attention to my thoughts and opinions. Our next speaker is Sarah Arnett. Can someone provide clarification on where the decision making power lies for how schools will operate in the fall? I'm hearing the district defer to the governor while the governor says local school districts can decide. What measures are already in place to assure when we can return? E-learning was not successful for my family, a senior, a freshman, a sixth grader, and a third grader, and I know I'm not alone. My children absolutely need the social and emotional support that comes with being instructed with their peers. I wish I had the words to properly convey how passionately I feel about this topic. Please, please, please take the steps necessary to move us in that direction. And if necessary, take the reins and lead our state to a return to normalcy. Our next speaker is Laura Murray. Academy District 20 Board of Education, thank you for hearing and responding to teachers this month. I know this has been a particularly difficult time to make decisions with information changing daily, if not hourly. I appreciate your commitment to all of the stakeholders in District 20 and hope that we can all work together to make the best decisions possible for students, staff, and parents as we move forward through this pandemic. My grandfather was a university administrator, a master storyteller, and a historian. His assessment of World War II was that there were innumerable instances of people being asked to perform duties far exceeding anything they had ever experienced, but rising to the challenge. This quote certainly applies to our world today. I am proud to be part of a school district that continues to rise to the challenge. Our next speaker is actually two speakers that have submitted one comment. It's Jordan Hare, Air Academy High School alumni and Ashlyn Hare, Rampart High School alumni. Dear Academy School District 20 Board of Education, in Academy School District 20, Black students are three times more likely to be suspended than white students. In Academy School District 20, Black students are, on average, academically 1.9 grades behind white students. At Woodman Roberts Elementary School, Black students are more than 20 times more likely to be suspended than white students. Black students at Woodman Roberts Elementary School make up approximately 1% of the student body. Nationally, Black teachers make up 7% of elementary and middle school public teachers. We are calling on the district to diversify faculties, address the disciplinary actions taken against Black students, and incorporate anti-racist curriculum into our institutions as early as elementary school. Over the past week, we collected testimonies from Black graduates of District 20 who recounted truly appalling instances of racism, discrimination, and criminalization. We must think critically about the message our teachers and policies are sending our children. Schools should be the place where institutional racism is challenged and abolished. The sanctuary where Black children can openly approach teachers and administrators who look like them and be met with love and forgiveness. 
not the very place where racist systems and stereotypes, stereotypes are perpetuated and enforced. It is time for us to recognize our role in promoting white supremacy and systematic racism in our education system. Modern day racism in Colorado Springs is subtle. It is not ill-intentioned. It is rooted in ignorance. It is never too late to change our opinions on racial injustice, recognize our shortcomings, and become better. Most of our white students, teachers, and administrators are likewise victims of the systems that taught them these unconscious biases. This is why it is so important that we promote diversity in our K-12 teaching faculties so that black teachers and administrators can dismantle the system, keeping our black peers from reaching their potential, and also so they can dismantle the implicit racist ideology built around our hearts. We ask that Academy School District 20 Board of Education actively educate yourselves on the ways in which your school district and education in America continues to, per to perpetuate white supremacy. Engage in conversations with your black students, teachers, and parents. Recognize your shortcomings, no matter how unintentional they are. Question the system that has been built for you and ask how you can better serve those you have failed. Our next presenter is Carrie Fox. Additionally, 102 teachers and community members signed her letter. Dear Superintendent Gregory and members of the Academy District 20 Board of Education, as staff members and parents, we would like to thank you for hearing our concerns, delaying the high school teacher schedule change, and giving staff a 1.25% one-time bonus to cover the parrot increases for next school year. We realize the challenges that lay ahead for our district, and we appreciate you hearing our voices in those decisions. We look forward to partnering with each of you to address our funding and reopening challenges with our legislators and advocating for our district during these difficult times. Our next speaker is Nipur Naik, DCCH alumni. DCC doesn't discuss uncomfortable things. As a predominantly white school, I wasn't surprised we didn't talk much about race. Why talk about something that makes 75% of your student body uncomfortable? I'm reaching out regarding a DCC student's Twitter thread. Several DCC students wanted a Black Student Alliance, but were encouraged to call it Diversity Club. Soon, other DC stu DCC students made a White Student Alliance on Instagram with the bio, all lives matter, not just the monkeys. The account posted despicably racist content and helped hack a disabled student's social media to harass others using the N-word. The DCC mission statement emphasizes developing students who are conscious global citizens. D20's mission statement challenges students to meaningfully contribute to a diverse society. A school presenting itself as global and diverse cannot suggest its black students combine with other clubs, thereby suppressing their black identities. You cannot create global citizens without teaching respect. My senior literature class read Othello, analyzing the impact of the dehumanizing language used to describe black people in a play written in 1603. Four centuries later, your students used equally offensive language calling black peers monkeys without consequence. I urge you to take responsibility, to increase transparency, and to have a conversation on race with future students. Much of the staff has changed since this specific situation. So I ask, can you confidently say things are better? How many similar situations reflecting racism within the community have occurred? Reflect on how many people of color are in leadership roles. Who is represented at student-led meetings? And if there are safe spaces for people of color? In the future, what will the response to a situation like this be? Today was my first time reading DCC's Code of Conduct. Racism is, racism is blanketed under all types of bullying and harassment and can result in expulsion, which did not happen here. Call racism what it is. Ensure students know the consequences. Marginalized students at DCC endure more in the effort to create a safe space than privileged students do for being actively racist. Please consider revising curriculum to include a conversation on race. 
I was lucky to be part of a course that taught Othello and fences. Discussing race with my peers left, left us more aware of racism. And while a curriculum addressing race alone will not eliminate racism, it will provide room for invaluable discussion. You are educating the leaders of tomorrow. I hope you'll spend time ensuring the remaining 25% of your school knows they are deserving of respect and that leadership and that the leadership you cultivate is respectful of everyone. That concludes our speakers for this evening. Thank you, Mrs. Cortez. And thank you to all of our speakers this evening. Um, your thoughts are always important to the board um, and they were quite profound this evening. So thank you again. And um, just remember that public comments continue to be important to all of us and it helps us become better at what we do. So thank you all. Um, I would like to now turn to um, for B on the agenda and I'll begin with board comments and I will start with Mr. Tembe this evening. Thank you, Mrs. Reynolds. Um, very sobering public comments this evening. Um, I'm looking forward to next week where we will actually have uh, in-person graduations in the district, uh, which is just an incremental step in the right direction uh, to re-engage people and uh, very much looking forward to graduations next week. Uh, much appreciation from me and I know many others uh, to uh, Mrs. Allen, uh, Brian Cortez, and everybody else in the district uh, who worked so hard on a very difficult um, uh, budget process this year. Um, and Mrs. Allen, I'm sure you're thinking about what a great year to start as the CFO. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, and on a general note, uh, and I want to dovetail to uh, Mrs. Kleininger's uh, quote and uh, some of the public comments that we heard, which is, I really do hope that the past 90 days of world events and protests uh, do bring about real change. Uh, most of all, a return to civility where we can all agree to disagree and exhibit more respect of one another. So that's my hope for the coming months. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Temby. Mr. Lundberg. Thank you, Mrs. Reynolds. I am looking forward also to in personal meetings with the Board of Education, public meetings like that. Uh, I'm also looking forward to the graduations. The kids deserve it and thank goodness we can provide it. I also want to put my support for the future of District 20. I think the board is a strong board. I think we will do what's necessary and we always do what's best for the kids. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lundberg. Mrs. Cloninger. Well, both Doug and Will um, said what I would like to say as well. I'm looking forward to next week. Um, and I would like to just say to those who um, have anything to do with seniors, to just encourage them to come because I know that some were disheartened by the, the way that we were doing it. And I know that they've all been announced that they can have two attendees with them. But just if you know friends that are, are um, hesitant maybe um, to encourage them to come and let us celebrate you because you certainly deserve this, uh, these accolades. Um, I also was so grateful for the district and for in such troubled times that we are even able to give the bonus um, to our teachers that rightfully deserve it. Um, I want the teachers who are listening to know that um, I, I hope and I, I can appreciate from Mrs. Murray and, and Mrs. Fox and others that that um, that the teachers are aware and are grateful and they they feel heard and they feel um, like they have been seen and and I hope that you recognize the efforts that have been made in, on your behalf by the district. Not not I'm not trying to say that egotistically. I'm saying Becky Allen and and her team, um, Brian Cortez. I think they deserve a lot of credit for this and um, I agree with Will as well that that's why I picked my quote because I think that we need to find ways to um, give each other some grace because we are in a time that everybody has strong heightened um, emotions um, and I you know tolerance is not acceptance 
It doesn't mean that we accept where we are or what's happened, um, but tolerance is giving each other some some room to breathe. So um, I too hope that we can get back to some civility and, and some normalcy. We know that the kids need to be in class and in front of their teachers and vice versa. So um, that's our hope. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Cloninger. Mr. Lavalley. Thank you. Um, basically, the, everybody else has have stolen my comments, but I, I too look forward to next week. I believe uh, I started off on Monday at Air Academy High School, their graduation. Parents can come now, which is awesome. Great news. I look forward to, uh, I, I hope all of our teachers, administrators, employees get, get a well-rested uh, summer, get some time off, and I'm looking forward to full up full instruction in the fall. Um, we desperately need it, and I know that our district is doing everything we can to, to enable that to happen. And I, I'm looking forward. We have some, some good news tonight. We, we had a chance to do a, a virtual lunch with, with two new uh, principals, and I, I think they're both great, going to be great principals, and I, I look forward to that, um, that vote as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lavelli. Colonel Harding. Nothing to add to uh, the thoughtful comments of my fellow board members. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Harding. So I have uh, four things that I'd like to share this evening, and I'm just going to uh, begin with the first one. <laughs> Makes sense, I guess. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you again to our sixth electronic board meeting. And, um, you know, we know that these meetings started on April 2nd as a result of COVID-19. And I am just so happy that we're going to begin our in-person board meetings again in July with our July 23rd board meeting, which will be held in our boardroom at the EAC beginning at six o'clock. Um, during these meetings, of course, we will be following all health department recommendations. So social distancing and masks will be part of each meeting, but you heard it from each other and from my colleagues tonight that it's something we all desperately want and need, and we want to need that for our students as well. Um, so. Here's to, to the start of that and, and hopefully it can continue on into the fall as well. Second, um, next week, and my colleague spoke to this too, promises to be a much needed celebratory time as we honor our seniors. Um, graduations are typically the highlight of the year for the board um, with all of us in attendance. This year though, will be a little different. There will be two of us at each graduation so that we can practice social distancing and keep attending numbers in line with health department guidelines. Um, nevertheless, I do know that I speak for all board members when I say that we are looking forward to these events. You heard that while they look different than they may have in past years, the spirit is the same. And that is to we is so that we can honor our students and their parents for the many accomplishments during their K-12 years and to wish them the best in their next adventures, wherever those may take them. Board members, you will have received your packet this evening from Mr. Gregory, um, Dr. Smith, uh, helped put that together as well, and it will tell us exactly what our parameters are and our expectations for our time to celebrate with the seniors. Third, um, I worked my way through the 2021 School Finance Act that was recently passed by our legislators, and I look forward to attending a Colorado Association of School Boards webinar next week to get a recap of this very unusual legislative session. And um, I just hope that some of my other board colleagues will be able to attend one of these two webinars as well. I think you've gotten the information about those, but if not and you're interested, let me know and we'll get that the specifics to you. In short, this is what I do know. We are very pleased that we will not have to face the level of cuts that we initially imagined. Uh, again, as other board members stated, I too am pleased that we can do what we have been able to do with the help of um, Mrs. Allen and Mr. Gregory and Mr. Cortez and the list could go on because I know that there's cabinet members working behind that as well. But I also know that the cuts are still profound and we can't forget that they are still profound for our district as they are across the state and that they will impact school districts for a few years to come, including ours. So um, it's not over, but it's a it's a fairly, fairly good news story um, as we begin in, in 2021. And finally, as we consider the hard work that needs to be done around equity in our world and our nation, I've been reflecting a lot and I remind myself that we can begin that best when we begin in our own communities and schools. To that end, I want to acknowledge the comments of the two commenters this evening. It's actually three because I realized there were two people on one comment. But I want to acknowledge that and tell you that, that I, I heard you and I know that my fellow board members did as well. And I want to reflect back to the report we got from our diversity committee at our May 7th board meeting. 
during which those committee members expressed appreciation for the conversations that they've had throughout the year. They reminded us then too, that we still have work to do. We will always have work to do when we talk about equity and the way we treat one another, and we must always be diligent and self-reflective. To that end, I will recommend to my board colleagues that our linkage during the 2021 school year be focused on hearing the stories and experiences of our students and staff of color so that we can use our learning from those experiences to better serve all of our students and staff. I know that Mr. Gergi and his leadership team are committed to this effort as well, and I look forward to them sharing their plans in this area. That ends board comments this evening, and I want to uh, turn this over to Mr. Gergi with administration comments. Thank you, Mrs. Reynolds. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Peek to speak, please. Thank you, Mr. Gregory, and good evening, board. It's my pleasure to introduce two recommended finalists for principal positions beginning the 2020-21 school year. First, I would like to introduce Gina Perez, I'm hoping we can maybe have a a picture up. Gina is being recommended for the position of principal for Foothills Elementary School. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Health Education and Biology from San Diego State University in San Diego, California, and a Master of Arts in Curriculum and Instruction from the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. Gina started her education career teaching middle school science and health education. She was part of the opening team at Creekside Middle School in Lewis Palmer School District 38 and taught for 16 years. Gina first served Academy District 20 as a teacher on special assignment for the Learning Services Department, where she successfully coordinated and implemented the Middle School Science Professional Development Conference organized and coordinated the middle school science teacher workshop and was a regular presenter for district professional learning classes. For the past nine years, many of you know, Gina has served as assistant principal at Timberview Middle School, where she's been a lead administrator for virtually every aspect of the school, including such things as curriculum instruction, assessment, special education, extracurricular activities, and even school-wide programs such as AVID. Here's a photo of Gina, and you can see some of her students from school. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Tori Ritchie. Tori is, the recommend, is recommended for the position of principal for the Homeschool Academy. I believe Tori is pictured here with his family on a vacation from last year with his wife, Amy, and daughter, Gwenin, who will be a ninth grader at Air Academy High School next year, and son, Finn will be a sixth grader at Eagle View next year. Tori holds a Bachelor of Arts in History, Political Science and Theater from Jamestown College in Jamestown, North Dakota, Master of Arts in Educational Leadership from the University of Phoenix at Colorado Springs, and a PhD in Educational Leadership from the University of Denver. Tori started his educational career in Laredo, Texas as a seventh grade history teacher and coach. He moved to Colorado and taught in Brush, Colorado before working for the United States Army for four years as an automated logistics specialist. Tori returned to teaching and coaching at Air Academy High School and in Harrison School District 2 before accepting an assistant principal position at Woodland Park High School. Tori then moved to Cheyenne, Wyoming, where he accepted his first principal position at a local high school. And upon coming back to Colorado, he served as an assistant principal at Fountain Fort Carson Middle School. For the past six years, Tori has served as the K-12 superintendent and principal at Cripple Creek Victor School District, and I believe they just wrapped up their graduation ceremony earlier today. Thank you, and this concludes my comments. Dr. Field, please. Yes. So I wanted to provide, good evening, I wanted to provide the board a quick update on our summer counseling program for pre-K 12 students that began Tuesday this week. So counseling is being provided by nine District 20 counselors in small groups, and that 
those small groups are either in person or virtual two hours a day, two times a week. For three weeks at the EAC, so the elementary groups can contain up to five students and the secondary groups can contain up to, to nine students. Parents are invited to attend with their elementary student and we have approximately 60 students uh, in the June session. The July session begins July 7th with 10 District 20 counselors providing small group counseling. And currently we have over 100 students signed up for in person and virtual counseling. So this has been very successful and our parents are so appreciative. Just a couple comments that were shared by parents this Tuesday when bringing kids into the EAC. Um, one parent had said that my child had expressed that she was scared about COVID-19 and really missed having social interactions with her peers. Um, another parent said that my child is eager to have in-person interactions with peers and hoping to make some new friends along the way. So uh, just uh, wanted to provide you all that update and let you know we're super proud of our counselors for providing this support. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Field. Uh, a, a very necessary program, obviously. Uh, high demand. Well, as you know, school has not been uh, school has been officially uh, out for a couple of weeks now, and uh, for several months prior to that, uh, students didn't report to school. So I don't have a lot. Uh, in fact, I don't have any uh, acknowledgments for this evening, but I would like to use this time to share some thoughts in response to both the public comments shared this evening and several concerns communicated to me during this past week. Two weeks ago, I stated Academy District 20 does not tolerate injustice, racism or hate, and that all staff and students must be treated with respect and treat each other with respect. In the last two weeks, I've heard student and staff stories that are concerning. If injustice and racism are hiding in our schools and in our system, we need to find them and we need to address them. While I don't have any immediate solutions, I recognize we have students who feel isolated, unheard and unequal. We need to identify our blind spots. We need to look into a mirror and see ourselves, our systems, our policies and our behaviors from different perspectives. And we need to understand the impact of injustice, racism and hate on our students and develop to implement solutions. To create change, we must first acknowledge and identify student experiences and perceptions. It saddens me and is discouraging to hear alumni student accounts of negative experiences, students we can no longer impact. We need to establish means to hear from current students on a regular basis. They need to have a voice and they need to be heard. You can expect to see an initiative addressing this topic in the coming weeks. Additionally, we will continue the important work of our diversity council, which started this past fall, which Ms. Reynolds referenced earlier. You heard an update from members of the council just a few weeks ago. Made of a diverse representation of staff and an outside consultant who also happens to be a D20 alum. This council is primarily focused on improving the workplace environment and attracting, retaining and celebrating a more diverse, high quality staff. This council will continue to do their work to transform our workplace environment to be inclusive and non-biased and to identify how to attract and retain high quality and a more diverse staff. We as Academy District 20 can't tolerate, cannot tolerate injustice, racism or inequality. We will work to eradicate hatred from our organization. I am certainly no expert in this area, but I know we have students, parents and staff equipped and ready to be part of the solution. We need to do better and we will do better. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. That's all I have this evening. Thank you, Mr. Gregory, and thank you for those words. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I also want to um, remind us um, as we move into the consent agenda that normally um, we would be able to be celebrating with uh, Ms. Perez and Dr. Ritchie this evening and I imagine that some of our attendees are here for that reason uh, to congratulate them if we vote for them on the consent agenda um, but I wanted to, to congratulate them as did Mr. Lavalley earlier this evening um, for being recommended for these positions. Um, it's an awkward unusual time but you are appreciated. 
Thank you, and um, I'm going to move on to agenda item number five, and that's our consent agenda. And we need a motion to approve the following resolutions. 187.20, approval of matters relating to administrative staff licensed. 188.20, approval of matters relating to administrative staff. Uh, excuse me, classified. 189.20, approval of matters relating to staff, specialist staff. 190.20, approval of matters relating to licensed staff teachers. 191.20, approval of matters relating to licensed staff, licensed support slash special services provider. 192.20, approval of matters relating to classified staff. 193.20, approval of monitoring report for executive limitations policy, EL 2.5, asset protection. 194.20, approval of MRE for the same. 195.20, approval of annual EL 2.10 district calendar. 196.20, approval of MRE for the same. 197.20, approval of annual GP 4.5, Monitoring Board Governance Process and Board Superintendent Relationship Policies. 198.20, approval of MRE for the same. 199.20, approval of annual GP 4.7, Board Committee Principles. 200.20, approval of MRE for the same. 201.20, approval of annual GP 4.8, Board Committee Structure. 2.2, 20 approval of MRE for the same. 20320 approval of annual GP 4.9 board agenda planning. 20420 approval of MRE for the same. 20520 approval of interfund borrowing authority. 20620 establish GASB 54 fund balance components for fiscal year 2020 2021. And approval of the Board of Education regular meeting minutes from June 4th, 2020. My part in moving this is so easy, so moved. <laughs> Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Lundberg? Aye. Mrs. Reynolds? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. Thank you all. Moving on to agenda item six, items pulled from the consent agenda. There are none. So we will move on to item seven and superintendent reports and resolution. And this in resolutions, and this is where we will be moving item 9B. And 9B again is um, the resolution to approve the modified Board of Education discretionary budget. So I need a motion, please, to approve resolution 21120, approval of modified Board of Education discretionary budget for fiscal year 2020 2021. So moved. Second. Have discussion, please, and I'll turn this over to Mr. Lavalley. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Um, so what we are discussing tonight, what we're going to vote on is the proposal to change the already approved board budget. Um, we approved it earlier this year, and um, we did discuss this at our working session about reducing it. We, we talked about a goal of 10%, and this, this uh, my recommendation to the board will, in fact, uh, as you can see, 10% would be public math, right? 11,000, and we're, we're reducing by 16,000. So we're certainly probably 15 to 17% reduction. Um, we, uh, Mr. Temby, Ms. Cortez, Ms. Adada, myself, met electronically to just to kind of discuss and, and, and finalize these recommendations after our board working session and this is what we came up with i remember during the working session we had a number of i think there were seven possibilities that i had come up with that we could look at we we ended up um, doing three of these or recommending three of these to the board um, i'll just briefly discuss them um, the, the biggest one as you can see minus twelve thousand, is is completely eliminating going to the nsba conference which we have done every year for a long time as a board um, we had talked about perhaps three of the five, uh, two new members and, and um, someone else going. And then upon further discussion, we, we just felt like it wasn't really worth our while to do that. Um, Mr. Gregory and Ms. Thompson would not be able to go this year because of the, um, the no travel uh, outside of the state uh, that we have in District 20 currently. So it would just be those three. And we just felt like while it's valuable, um, that that was something that we could we could cut. So that's the twelve thousand dollar change there. Um, reducing our annual retirement banquet. If you'll notice, that's a four thousand dollar reduction. Um, 
and this also, you may recall, we did not have the retirement banquet that we uh, in May like we normally do. Um, the I don't want to speak out of turn here, but I, I I believe the the thought the intent is perhaps to combine those that we're going to retire this May with those that are going to retire um, next year into one banquet. So so what you're seeing that fourteen thousand dollar budget uh, versus eighteen will take both of those groups together. So this is not just well, it is one bank. What I, I believe that's the plan. Although, I, again, I'm, I might be speaking out of turn. And I, I talked with Ms. Ms. Cortez, and she is pretty confident this is the board portion of this. There is some other monies that is spent from um, Ms. Cortez's budget, um, but this is just our part. Uh, and she was fairly confident that we can we can do this um, with all those extra folks for 14. Um, and, and I just say that if if it works. Give Ms. Cortez the credit, and if it doesn't, I'll take the blame. Um, and then finally, uh, you won't see it on here, but we had a discussion about reducing board meals, and um, we are pretty confident we can reduce uh, the cost of the board meals. They cost a maximum, they're typically $200, $250 per board meeting. We have 22 meetings. That'll save us around $500 to $550 per year. Uh, that comes out of general supplies. Uh, we just decided to keep the general supplies fixed at 20,000, but but I'm optimistic that we're going to be able to be under that 20,000 going forward. So those were the three that we decided to recommend to the board to vote on. So are there any questions? I, I think I covered everything that I wanted to cover with with the uh, modified uh, board budget. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. Um, do any board members have questions? I'll start with Will. Do you have any questions or comments? Uh, no questions. Just wanted to uh, commend Mr. Lavalley for uh, thinking about our proportional piece of this budget and uh, a little bit of sacrifice here, but uh, times require it. So um, thanks for the initiative, Mr. Lavalley. And thank you for your work on this as well, Mr. Temby. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Lundberg. No questions. Thank you. Mrs. Conninger. No questions. Miss, oh, I don't suppose I need to call Mr. Lavalley. How about Colonel Arden? No questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to add that because um, we are, I don't think I said this earlier, but um, because we are going to begin our board meetings in July, but we're going to begin our board meetings at six o'clock. We will not be serving dinner until we get spotlights back um, in the fall, if, whenever that happens, if that happens. So there'll be some savings there too. Mr. Lavelle, I just thought I'd throw that in, give your comment about food. So, um, and I also wanted to let everyone know that that's not going to be happening um, until we have our spotlights back with students in our presence. Uh, Mr. Lavelle, thank you for your work on this. And, and it sounds to me, if there's no other comments, that we can do a roll call on this. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mr. Lavelle? Aye. Mr. Lundberg? Aye. Mrs. Reynolds? Aye. Mr. Temby. Aye. All right, thank you all. We're now going to move on to item 7A. And that is the, uh, we need a motion to approve res resolution 20720, approval of budget adoption for fiscal year 2020-2021. So moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. Any discussion? Yes, thank you. First, I want to thank the board for uh, the work session uh, prior to the, uh, I guess, following the, the proposal of the budget. Uh, it was uh, very effective, very useful, uh, and the outcomes, uh, at least on responses I've received, are very much appreciated. So I just wanted to thank the board for that. And, and at this time, I turn it over to Ms. Allen for her comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. Thank you to board members for your kind comments that you made. I do appreciate it. Um, so this evening, the 2021 budget is ready to be considered for adoption. Here is a very brief summary of the highlights of this budget. The per pupil revenue amount uh, is $7,642, um, which is a difference of about $273 from what you saw in the proposed budget on May 21st. This represents a reduction of 6.7% to the projected 
District 20 minimum per pupil revenue for 2021. Another way to state this is it's a reduction of a little over 5% to this year's current per pupil revenue amount. This equates to a reduction of about $9 million. In this budget, $1.7 million in impact aid that typically goes to the technology fund will be redirected to the general fund. Instead of transferring 2.8 million to the cap reserve fund, only 500,000 will go to cap reserve. The transfer to the transportation fund will be reduced by about $459,000. $1.5 million of risk management reserve will be used to meet general fund expenditures. Non-school department budgets such as business services, human resources, learning services, etc. will be reduced by 10%. And it's important to note that that's not referring to departments at schools like math department, social studies, etc. The green grant will not be available next year. The $115 cafeteria contribution will be eliminated for next year. Salaries will remain the same next year as they currently are. In the fall, staff will receive a one-time non-recurring 1.25% lump sum payment. Despite health care costs uh, increasing by $2 million next year, health insurance premiums for staff will remain the same next year as they currently are. And the savings from elimination of the cafeteria contribution will all go towards the $2 million increase in addition to another $500,000 that District 20 will spend. This budget uses $3.4 million from the 3% Tabor Emergency Reserve. And finally, just as one other summary statement, the budget that you have in front of you in the general fund is upside down by about $1.8 million. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you, Mr. Timby. No questions, thank you. Mr. Lumberg. No questions, thank you. Mrs. Cloninger. Just gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Lavelli. Uh, just yeah, gratitude, and and I, I didn't say it during board comments, but I, I'm I'm thrilled that we were able to do this, and and even to give a one time a bonus to to if you will uh, fix the the para increase. I, I'm I'm just thrilled that we're able to do that to our our valuable staff. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. Colonel Harding. Oh man, what a ride! Can we not do this again anytime soon, please? Thank you. <laughs> I agree with you, Colonel Harding. Um, again, gratitude from me as well, Mrs. Allen, Mrs. Mr. Cortez, Mr. Gregory. Thank you for your hard work on this, um, as well as cabinet, of course. Um, and I I'm just thrilled that we can do this for our staff and for for our staff that has worked so hard for us and for our students. So, thank you again. And it appears that. Those were short responses. I think we're all feeling the same thing. So I'm going to move to a roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger. Aye. Mr. LaValle. Aye. Mr. Lundberg. Aye. Mrs. Reynolds. Aye. Mr. Temby. Aye. All right. Thank you. I'm going to move on to item 7B, our strategic planning update. Mr. Gregory. Yes, I would invite Dr. Smith, I guess, yeah, to the you. podium. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Gregory. And good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to give an update about the strategic planning efforts in our district. As we've shared in the past, in August of 2019, Mr. Gregory announced the strategic planning would be an initiative for the 2019-2020 school year. Shortly after Mr. Gregory made this commitment, a large, broadly representative group of stakeholders was formed and began meeting monthly starting in October of 2019. Prior to the first meeting, all stakeholder groups like the DAC, Parent Sounding Board, Teacher Communication Council were provided the opportunity to share ideas about what we should start doing, stop doing, and continue doing as a district. That initial collected data was shared with the Strategic Planning Steering Committee. It was discussed and ultimately we added that to the current state of the district report. In addition to the monthly meetings, the smaller lead team comprised of Kimberly Sherwood, Debbie Sagan, who you've met, Allison Cortez and me, 
coordinated an open forum event on March 10th at Chinook Trail Middle School. The event was well attended and included parents, students, staff, community members, and even two, two board members. And the conversations and findings validated many of the themes and ideas that had surfaced with the Strategic Planning Steering Committee. Additionally, while the full committee had selected two dates, March 30th and 31st for the two day intensive visioning and development work at the Great Wolf Lodge, that event had to be canceled and we are looking to reschedule it for a later date. That said, following the district's closure due to COVID-19, the Strategic Planning Steering Committee realized the need to regroup in an effort to continue with the meaningful work while also maintaining the positive energy and momentum of the full committee. During the closure, the committee met three times. At these meetings, we discussed the findings from the open forum event. We finalized a draft of the current state of the district report, and we began planning for the path ahead. And while this project has been energized and exciting and personally just a, a, a project of passion, the challenge of not being able to physically meet, or share ideas and learn together, coupled with the ongoing demands of moving all aspects of school online, the, the committee began to show signs of fatigue. Following one of the May meetings, we began to hear from committee members that they would like to wait until the fall to re-engage in this important work. After having a conversation with the two facilitators and problem solving as the smaller lead team, we decided to propose putting this project on ice with the express desire to return to it in the fall. At the June Strategic Planning Steering Committee meeting, this plan was shared and was received with gratitude and support. Therefore, we are temporarily stopping the strategic planning process due to staff member fatigue and exhaustion. The planning committee consisting of me and Allison, Debbie and Kimberly will continue to meet throughout the summer and we're developing an updated course of action for the fall. When everyone returns in August, we will not miss a beat and we will resume our work and I have no doubt that we will have the new vision framework completed by December. I just wanted to give an update to you as some things have changed from the last time we had uh, Kimberly and Debbie present. But what questions do you have for me? Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, I was part of that conversation and I really appreciated the way it was shared with the group and the group's response. Just my uh, thoughts and thank you for sharing that tonight. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. Mr. Temby. Um, Dr. Smith, thanks for that update, and I think that's prudent. Um, those are very important sessions, and doing them virtually, I think there's a lot of things lost in translation there. So I think that's a good decision. Um, you know, obviously, there's something that has risen up uh, <laughs> over the past few weeks, and that is the uh, issue of racism. And uh, obviously the district is taking that uh, with great gravity. Um, uh, do you see that being woven in to the strategic plan uh, in any manner as it's as the process is reintroduced in the fall, Dr. Smith? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Mr. Temby. I think a few things. One is in the current state of the district report, we, do, we did look at a, a series of data and including the what should the district start doing, stop doing, continue. Yeah. And in all of those different data pieces, I think you could find elements that point to these very issues um, that not all students are performing at the same level. Um, uh, not all students are feeling as safe in our schools as others. And so these are opportunities, I think, for to, to look at, to examine, to continue our work. And I think it only supports uh, furthering efforts that Mr. Gregory was describing this evening about um, addressing issues of race and equity. Great, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Temby, Mr. Lundberg. Just a thank you to Dr. Smith. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Lundberg. Thank you, Mr. Mrs. Cloninger. Um, Thank you, I just appreciate uh, the fact that people are feeling worn out and that uh, it's not a trying to <laughs> run away from hard conversations or anything like that, but I agree with Will, um, with Mr. Temby, with the idea that in-person is much more effective, but also may give you the opportunity to kind of reassess what has happened this summer and what um, things need to be implemented. And uh, we, we don't know what we don't know, so it's good to wait until we kind of have more answers. Yes, thank you, Mr. Klonger. Yes, thank you. Mr. Lavalley. 
Yeah, thanks, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, thanks, Dr. Smith. You heard my comment earlier about I hope everyone gets a, a good relaxing summer and and so your decision <laughs> to put this on ice just flows right along with that. So I think it's a good decision. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Lavalle and Colonel Harding. Thank you, Mrs. Reynolds. Yeah, it seems like when we run into uh, a lot of activity and a lot of adversity, sometimes the forward thinking planning efforts are the first things that fall off the table. But I got to say, I, I fully endorse this, uh, this what we would call in the Air Force, a strategic pause. Um, <laughs> it, we're nowhere near the same place when we started this effort in October of 2019. And it's actually an opportunity to kind of absorb everything we've been through in the in the past nine months from you know world events and, and COVID and everything in between so I'm, I'm confident that when we resume it'll be uh, even stronger and better informed than it was before over yeah thank you Colonel Harding I agree I mean we started out uh, running super strong and hard and uh, you know very passionate work and I think everybody was willing to stick with it in fact we had several conversations about uh, our folks willing willing to stick through this even if we go virtual and uh, the heart was there but uh, the fatigue uh, began to set in, uh, like a lot of a lot of a lot of different aspects in our lives during this this closure. So I do appreciate that. Thank you, Colonel Harding. Yes, thank you, Colonel Harding. And Dr. Smith and Mrs. Cortez, thank you for your work on this. I know that you've invested a lot of time, energy, and it's it's in your heart. So I'm looking forward to what will occur again when we restart. Anybody else? Okay, so I'm going to move on to item 7C, monthly financial report through May 2020, Mr. Gregory. Yes, Ms. Becky Allen, please. Good evening. What you have in front of you is the monthly financial report through the end of May 2020. We have collected 70% of our revenue so far, which is compared with 71% last year at this time, so very similar. Spending is on track with our expectations. Our expenditures are at 91% of budget, a bit higher than last year when they were at 88%. Finally, as of May 31st, our cash flows in exceed our total cash flows out by about $25 million. Do you have any questions for me? Mr. Tempe? No questions. Mr. Lundberg? Happily, no questions. <laughs> Mrs. Conninger. I I agree with Mr. Lemberg. <laughs> Mr. Lavelli. I agree with Ms. Conninger. Colonel Harding. I agree with Mr. Lavelli. Well, that's great, and I agree with all of you. So, Mrs. Allen, thank you for a nice report, as always. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to item 7D, and we need a motion to approve resolution 20820. That's the approval of 2020 2021 ESEA consolidated federal programs application. Mr. Gregory. So yes, Dr. Dr. Susan Field, please. I'm sorry. Let's, let's go. Let's go back. Mr. Lundberg, thank you so much for making the motion. I need a second. Second. Thank you. I jumped too fast. Mr. Gregory, please. Oh, well, it's a very exciting topic, Ms. Reynolds. That's probably Oh, I know. Why. It's what kept me going, you know, it brought <laughs> memories. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Field, please. Yes. Good evening again. So I am going to provide you just a little bit of some context around how we're going to spend some of this money. So I present this annual update about the ESSA grant to the board this evening for your approval of our allocations. In order to make decisions around the allocations, the learning services team collaborates with principals and directors to decide how to spend the ESSA grant dollars. As you saw in the board item, our funding allocation for the 2020-2021 school year is $1,612,070, I'm sorry, $1,612,077, which is an increase of $84,914. So of the seven areas that you can see listed, mostly for your information, we are funded in four areas this coming year. The last couple of years, we have received Title IIA immigrant set-aside funds, but not this year, and that's happened in years past as well. It just it depends on several factors. Um, Title IIA is assistance to help students struggling in reading and math who attend the 
five District 20 schools with the highest percent of free and reduced lunch students. So this year we are in the process of phasing Douglas Valley out as a Title I school. They will still be a Title I school uh, for 2021 and phasing Prairie Hills in as a Title I school. So three years of free and reduced lunch data indicates that Douglas Valley's rate, uh, free and reduced lunch rate percentage has dipped well below the 30% threshold. And we use uh, in District 20, 30% free and reduced lunch as kind of our threshold for who should be um, receiving Title I funds. And Prairie Hills, uh, their free and reduced lunch rate has increased to almost 30%. So with the estimated allocation of $1,166,720, 1% of that goes to parent education and support. And then the rest of it is distributed to the five schools, Frontier, High Plains, Doug Valley, Pioneer, and Prairie Hills. And it's distributed on a per pupil basis. And also um, we, uh, pay for 0.5 FTE for Jean Tay, our budget analyst out of this uh, Title I funding as well. So that's Title I. Title II A is about professional learning and we will receive this year $319,632, sorry, $319,632, which is a decrease um, of nearly $16,000. Um, we, as you know, we did not get to do Summer Institute this summer, and we have a substantial carry forward in Title II funds that we'll, we will get to move forward that will support kind of an offset this uh, decrease. But Title II, we utilize heavily in Summer Institute. We utilize for high school, middle, and elementary instructional coaches. We use it for leadership development and support for principals. We um, support HR with the recruitment of highly qualified teachers. We provide a lot of professional learning and technology and Schoology. AVID receives professional learning dollars here. In recent years, we've also added the Kennedy Center Partnership for the Arts. And um, we are also providing training for trauma-informed care and our schools are receiving coaching in the professional learning community model through Tom Manny, who is somebody that we've been consulting with for nearly three years now. So that's Title II. Title IIA is ESL Support Services, and our allocation for this next year will be $50,294, which is an increase of $3,651, and that is used for professional learning, testing materials, a lot of it is spent on translators, um, ESL teacher support, and then we also have uh, an adult education program that we use these funds for. And then finally, Title IVA, uh, which is student support and academic enrichment. The allocation moving forward will be $77,172, a decrease of just under $2,000 for next year. And we utilize this fund to help pay fees, uh, AP and IB exam fees for students that are on free and reduced lunch. Um, we've uh, used this money or, and will continue to for project based learning training, for culturally relevant teaching and learning um, support and training, health and wellness, our health and wellness initiative and our uh, social emotional learning initiative, which also supports sources of strength. We've spent um, funding and will continue to spend funding on digital integration, and that is a lot of our Schoology and our initial Schoology training that we did and just digital integration support for teachers. And then next year we will be adding um, dollars or allocating dollars rather for dyslexia training for our new program that we will be beginning. And also we've earmarked some money for equity work. So as you can see in the document, uh, we are not funded in all areas. They were left in for your reference as funding sometimes becomes available in future years with the changes in the ESSA grant. So I also give this report and share this information with the DAC in September. So that is my report. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Or sorry, geez, Dr. Field. And I wasn't kidding when I said, I love this report. It's true. I know it's unusual, but I do. Thank you. And I'll speak to that when it's my turn. I'll move to Mr. Timby. Thank you, Dr. Field. That was well explained. Um, 
a question, and this is a question of some ignorance. Um, with the advent of this COVID-19 CARES Act money, can any of that money be further leveraged on the digital learning side? For Oh, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, learning services and a lot of cabinet have been working closely with Ms. Allen on uh, CARES dollars and um, also our ESSER funds. And we have significant dollars allocated toward um, technology, toward training for teachers in Schoology and uh, just ongoing professional learning. Great. Yeah, it's a unique opportunity. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Temby. Mr. Lundberg. No questions. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Conninger. I also have no questions, but I appreciate the forethought of um, like um, Mr. Temby had asked about the digital piece because inevitably that part will come up. So um, appreciate all the work you've done. Thank you, Mrs. Conninger. Mr. Lavalley. Thank you, Dr. Field. No questions. Colonel Harding. I still agree with Mr. Lavalley. <laughs> Thank you, Colonel Harding. Um, and I too appreciate the conversation about the digital learning and I know the work that goes into making decisions with your team about what is a good um, expenditures of these dollars. And I have to tell you, I really appreciate hearing trauma-informed care, the culturally relevant teaching, the social emotional learning and the equity work all continue. And um, appreciate that, along with all those other things that you spoke about. They're all important, but those those rise to the surface right now. So thank you, Dr. Field, for um, a job well done. Thank you, Mrs. Reynolds. You bet. And um, roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger. Aye. Mr. Lavalley. Aye. Mr. Lundberg. Aye. Mrs. Reynolds. Aye. Mr. Tempe. Aye. All right, thank you all. We're now moving on to 7E. And we need a motion to approve resolution 20920, approval of purchase for district technology devices over a million dollars. So moved. Second. Discussion, please, Mr. Gregory. Yeah, we'll probably teamwork this one, but uh, we'll have Ms. Kuzer lead it off. Thank you, Mr. Gregory, and good evening, board members. As you know, in May of 2020, Academy School District 20 received a little over $10 million in the coronavirus relief funds. These funds apply to direct costs incurred from March 1st, 2020 through December 30th, 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. There are many allowable uses for these funds. However, this specifically is going to be focused on funding. Uh, this resolution is really specifically focused on funding to assist with the facilitation of distance learning. Uh, my department is seeking approval to proceed with a technology device purchase using the CRF dollars in accordance with the CRF allowable use requirements in an amount not to exceed $4 million. And at this time, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mrs. Kuzer and Mr. Temby. Yeah, again, we've got a unique opportunity uh, with the uh, CRF. Uh, and so, uh, Ms. Kuzer, uh, could you just explain a little bit in terms of the breakdown of, of what you're looking to purchase and, and uh, how it will be uh, used, distributed? Uh, you know, yes. if you could just give us a little detail as to what you're thinking here. Certainly. And uh, just know, kind of, we started these conversations, obviously. <laughs> we made sure that students um, had devices or had access to a device at home um, shortly after the May 13th, uh, you know, stay at home orders. And uh, since that time, there's been a lot of conversation with principals um, on what would look, you know, like a successful program. In addition, we utilized the replenishment program evaluation that was done by Dr. Heidi Pace um, in conjunction with a lot of other stakeholders um, earlier in the fall and really kind of utilizing and making sure that we always kept the focus on students first with the replenishment money. So this did give us a unique opportunity um, to use additional funds to ensure that we would have equity of devices and that was really 
the key point in the replenishment program evaluation. So um, we have about a little over 22,000 students that are non-charter school or non-charter students in District 20. Right now um, we have, and when we're looking at this breakdown, we'd be looking at grades three through um, 12 in having a access to a device, whether that be at home or at school, they would have that option. But this would provide for that distance learning if on a dime we had to um, continue learning in a home environment, they could take that device with them. And the principals really felt that that would be um, adequate and fabulous from the standpoint of making sure that we did have that equity for those devices. So that is the initial thinking and uh, we would um, we did some numbers, some number crunching and we would be right around purchasing 11,000 additional devices. Um, so, and then grades one through three, or K through, I'm sorry, K through two would have a shared device on, and that, because most of their content would not necessarily, you know, require them taking a device home. Great. Thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. the explanation. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you, Mr. Tembe. Um, Mr. Lundberg. Mrs. Guzer, is there any accommodation for students who might not have internet access when they get a hold of a, a, a smart device? Yes, as a matter uh -huh. of fact, Mr. yeah, Mr. Lundberg, um, um, one of the things that we did uh, early um, in March is that we ordered 100 hotspots, and these are called Kajit hotspots, so they're filtered um, with educational standards according to SIPA. And what that means is that, you know, they can't get to, um, you know, bad content whether they're at home. But additionally, what we ended up doing is we worked with all the schools. We had 100 Kajit hotspots that were distributed. And ironically, what we found is that for some of our higher needs, we didn't need the hotspots. They already had internet access, which was kind of, a, it was a good news story. But we did serve about 50 um, students yeah. consistently with those hotspots. And so that was a benefit of having that. And we still have that available for us. Thank you. We're talking about doing things for kids. This is really great. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, Mrs. Conninger. Um, I just was going to say, I know that um, I, I am so grateful that uh, things are being put in place because the turn on a dime phrase is <laughs> what kind of put everybody into a, a frenzy, obviously, in March. Um, but I but I also recognize that these are not I mean, these um, devices and things like that are so well utilized when it's in person learning as well, because I know that people scramble for, um, you know, a classroom set or this, that or the other. So I feel like going forward, um, it's going to benefit whichever direction we need to be in. So I appreciate that work. Thank you. That's a great point, Mrs. Conninger. Um, thank you. And uh, Mr. LaValle. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kuzer. So I, I don't want to get too much in the weeds. These hotspots, what do they tap off of like 4G to allow these kids to use their, their devices at home? Is that how that correct. works? Correct. Yeah, correct. They actually have to run off of a, a cell tower, just like your, your phone hotspot. Um, and there is limitations on data so that we make sure that, you know, um, we can actually prioritize sites that they go to so they can really um, kind of hone in on you know, what work they're doing from home. And what we found is that the number one site that was being used this uh, summer was Schoology. That's good, good news story. So it sounds like you guys are getting a great deal. I, I did the math and I I was saying at $800 a device with $4 million, you'd, you'd buy 5,000 devices and you guys are getting 11,000. So you must be getting these for under, what, 350 bucks. Um, that's great. How are you going to prioritize? So, so it sounds like, any student in D20 from third grade and up who does not have their own device will be able to get one? Is that the plan? Well, we also have existing devices in schools. So yeah. we we really have to, the next step would be to determine, you know, how many we would have to, to give to each site. So that is part of our next plan um, as we go forward. But, um, you know, first would be placing the order because we know that we're not the only school district in the U.S. that is doing this. So we want to make sure that the sooner we can get these ordered to receive them appropriately as well. 
Okay, I saw from Dell, so they won't be iPads. But would they be a laptop computer type thing? They are. It's it's actually a, a 3190 is the actual model, and it is a touch screen. So it's a, a great size for, for students. It's not huge. It's not heavy. It also has a lot of protections as far as the screen, um, the glass on it. It's Gorilla Glass, so it kind of holds up a little bit better to, you know, drops. And there's also protections on the key board for spills. So it doesn't mean they can't be destroyed, but they are a little bit more suitable for a K-12 environment. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So, OK, so it sounds like then we're going to be able to provide, if necessary, a device for every. So initial, my initial question before was, you know who's going to get these but with 11,000 I dare say anybody who needs one should be able to get one is that is We will I we're per going to plan to provide for all students grades 3 through 12 for one to one Yeah if they need one okay um yep. very good thank you Ms. Goozer appreciate it You're Very welcome Colonel Harding No questions it's a great initiative to make sure we keep the playing field level for everybody as we've talked about before over agree with all of those comments. Uh, Mrs. Kuzer, thank you so much. And I actually look forward to hearing how uh, we're, we will spend the remaining uh, co uh, coronavirus relief fund dollars, but I know that that will be determined over time. But this is a great beginning. Um, you're doing good things for kids, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. You bet. And so we have a motion on the table. We need roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mr. LaValle? Aye. Mr. Lundberg? Aye. Mrs. Reynolds? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. Okay, so we're on uh, item agenda item 7F. We need a motion to approve resolution 20, sorry, resolution 21020, approval of construction contract award for district asphalt and concrete repairs over a million dollars. So moved. Second. Discussion, please, Mr. Gregory. Yes, Ms. Allen, please. This evening we have a resolution for consideration regarding the contract over $1 million. As you know, just like the one that Ms. Kuzer shared with you a moment ago, board approval is required for contracts over $1 million. A little bit of background for this particular one. In January, a contract with Tracks Construction was executed for asphalt and concrete repairs at DCC and Mountain Ridge in the amount of $859,000. For both Mountain Ridge and DCC, the contract included con concrete repairs, a deep repair of large cracks in the parking lots all the way down to the substructure, and seals over the entire parking lots. Work has been completed at Mountain Ridge and during the course of the work, there were very minimal changes in scope to the project. Uh, a change order for just under $7,000 was needed at Mountain Ridge for some unexpected conditions that were discovered while the project was being completed. At DCC, while work was being completed, it was determined that the underlying substrate in the elementary school parking lot was not performing well and additional repairs were needed uh, also because of freezing and thawing issues that occurred after the contractor first examined the parking lot. These additional expenses total about $210,000. That would bring in essence the contract's new total to about 1.1 million. The resolution you are considering this evening would also approve a total contract with tracks for asphalt and concrete repair in an amount not to exceed 1.4 million. That additional $300,000 requested really addresses repairs at three other schools. First of all, Woodman Roberts Elementary School needs repair uh, in its bus loop. Pioneer Elementary School uh, requires some asphalt repair near their portables and at Rampart, uh, their parking lot needs to be sealed and restriped uh, in the south lots. And also there needs to be some repairs in the service drive and fire lane along the north side of the parking lot. So all of those together um, are really what comprise that $1.4 million that uh, you are requested con to consider in this resolution. 
Do you have any questions for me? Thank you, Mrs. Sullivan. Mr. Timby? Uh, no major questions. It's just, you know, it's quite a bit of creep over the original uh, scope of things uh, clearly needed. Uh, just a commentary. I live near Challenger and uh, Challenger is, is uh, not addressed in here. And if there's a school both aesthetically and structurally that needs some work, uh, that's one. So I'm hope that uh, and this is a question more for Mr. Uh, White Reasoner, but uh, I hope that's scheduled uh, soon uh, because there's quite a bit of curb, curb, gutter and asphalt work needed there. Um, but I'm, you know, certainly in favor of uh, this expenditure uh, to get this work done and done before the next school year, but uh, considerably over the original scope. So uh, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Lumberg. Uh, not exactly a question, but I'll politely say I think we're in the wrong business. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lumberg. Mrs. Cloninger. Doug, you're killing me. <laughs> um, and I agree with you. Uh, I would assume that some of the work that will be going on at, at Challenger, I can, um, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but I'm assuming some of that um, work would be based on the um, stuff that has, the building that has been going on there. Um, but I agree. I think that's one place that needs it. Um, but I agree this is just, uh, a necessary part of getting into the building. So I I agree with this, so thanks. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Mrs. Conjure. Mr. Lavalley. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. I, I thought exactly what Mr. Lundberg said. Uh, no, no comments. Uh, uh, thank you, Ms. Allen. Colonel Harding. Well, certainly no argument with the, the necessity of doing this, um, but I am curious as to why the, the span in time between when the survey was conducted and when the RFP comes out. I mean, it's looking to be about two and a half years. Is that normal? Well, they go through, um, you know, as was described, what I call kind of a facility audit process and, and Rocky Mountain pavement um, certainly did a, a condition, a look at conditions at that point. And uh, part of the delay is just uh, the funding resources that are available, that the scope of everything to do at one time um, would certainly be ta too taxing on the budget. So things are paced out to be able to be done in a time that, that can match the resources. And um, as I mentioned, just some conditions can change from even when, even after that survey, when the contractor comes on site, and examines the, the parking lot and says, okay, I think this is what it will be. Even depending on the time of year, as was the case with this, you have that freezing and thawing, and now all of a sudden there are some changes and some additional repairs that need to be made. So um, though, though that's some of the reasoning behind it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and um, thank you, Mrs. Allen for another great report and for explaining some things and great questions from the board. I have nothing to add. Ms. Reynolds, if, if I may just add one thing just yes. to make sure everybody's clear. Sure. Uh, that these are, since Ms. Allen just presented earlier tonight, uh, the adopted budget for next year, which reduces the uh, transfer from the general fund to the cap reserve fund to uh, only $500,000. That's that's the pot of money that's paying for these kinds of things. This is not bond money; it's cap reserve money. So, to several of the questions, especially Mr. Hard, uh, Colonel Harding, the you know when the uh, audit of our parking lots was done, uh, you know it's put on kind of a rank order list of what's most needy to least needy, and then that's uh, you know captured in multiple years over what budget dollars are available. Uh, I just want to reinforce the importance of, you know, recovering from this budget year in the near future is going to be important or dollars won't be available for uh, repairs like this in future years. Uh, that's all I wanted to say is make sure folks know that this is not bond money. This is our building fund money. This is out of our annual cap reserve money. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, Tom. 
yeah, indeed. Indeed, that does help. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. OK, um, we have a motion and we need a roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Lumberg? Aye. Mrs. Reynolds? Aye. Mr. Tumby? Aye. All right, thank you all. We're moving on to item 7G, which is the 2020 Summer Projects Update. Mr. Gregory. Yeah, we'll turn it over to Ms. Allen. She will probably turn it over to somebody else, but Ms. Allen. Yes, um, if I could please uh, introduce Mr. Bob Lund, Director for Facilities. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Mrs. Allen, Mr. Gregory, and the board. Good to hear all of you again. So I have a theme like every year or every summer that I present this, and so this year it's water. So we're keeping water out of the building. So with that, next slide, please. And so we just talked about asphalt concrete repair and replacement. So thank you for approving that resolution. That's very helpful for us. And so as you talked about Discovery Canyon campus, the picture that you're seeing right there is Liberty High School. We also did work at Mountain Ridge. When you go next week to graduations, the parking lot now is done. It's all striped. It looks great over there. So hopefully that's a good, good thing for the media and everybody else when they come over and celebrate the graduations. Some work was done at Pine Creek High School and at Rampart High School. The work that was done on this this summer is money that was out of the general fund that we allocate for doing concrete repair. So we replaced some concrete, removed a planter, etc. at Rampart High School. Next slide, please. So exterior waterproofing. So a lot of these these four schools, some of them are all the same model of school, and so we sealed the exterior of the brick on these schools. So Academy Endeavor, Academy International, Antelope Trails, Discovery Canyon, and Explorer Elementary School. Next slide, please. We also did some exterior brick and stucco repair where we were getting water intrusion in the schools. So at Challenger Middle School, actually the woodpeckers are causing a lot of problem there. Edith Wolford Elementary School and at Foothills Elementary School. Next slide, please. And here and some of the priorities, I think it's important that we have some better curb appeal as much as limited as we can since we don't really water our grass that much anymore. But this is a picture of antelope trails. And if you've been up there before, you've seen that roof. If you're looking there, it looks great. It used to be all rusted and it looked terrible. So right now I think it looks really great at, Ante at, Acad at antelope trails. Sorry. We also did exterior painting of when I say the exterior painting, a lot of this is the metal. So we sealed some of the brick, but now we've gone back and painted the door frames, the window frames, and maybe the metal on the top of the roof. So we did that at Douglas Valley Elementary School, Foothills and High Plains. So if you have a chance, those schools look great right now. Along with this theme, next slide, please. Here is exterior ceiling and what this that's different from the waterproofing that the previous slide. This here is where the building meets the asphalt. And we get a lot of moisture and water in these areas. So I'm not going to read all those, but you can see where we hit quite a few schools to seal up to try to keep moisture out of the schools. Next slide, please. So direct digital controls in the past, this is how we can control the heating, ventilating and air conditioning or HVAC equipment that are at the sites, which allows us to greatly minimize hot and cold calls. And I just want to give a shout out to our HVAC supervisor, Daniel Kindred. He does a great job with this. I believe Henry will talk about some of these in his update to the board, but we have a lot of involvement with our HVAC techs and supervisor to make sure these systems operate properly. For example, somebody goes, hey, room 113 is cold. We don't have to send somebody out there. We can just log in and look and make the corrections or find out that we have a problem and then send a technician. So we've reduced a lot of the hot, hot and cold calls in the schools by upgrading and installing direct digital controls. Next slide, please. Here we've done playground equipment. This picture is, you know, I think what every elementary school principals wish was, is what they look like. But what we're doing is we're just replacing some equipment at some of the schools. 
we do a yearly inspections and equipment needs to be replaced. And so at Discovery Canyon Elementary School, Edith Wolford, Frontier, High Plains, and Woodman Roberts, we're updating the playground equipment. Next slide, please. So this year flooring at the portable, Art Portable at Academy Endeavor. In addition to that, they also are doing projects to replace some of the flooring inside their school. Next slide, please. So the theme was keeping water out. So at those schools that we've sealed the exterior ceiling, we're also going to remove the wallpaper on the exterior walls because moisture gets trapped behind there. And so we're doing wallpaper removal at Academy Endeavor, Academy International, Air Academy High School, and Frontier Elementary School. Next slide, please. Here are these lighting upgrades. These are projects that were utilize a lot of the green grant money in conjunction with the money that some of the schools put in. So Academy Endeavor, Explorer, Mountain Ridge, Prairie Hills, and the Da Vinci Academy. The biggest one was probably the Mountain Ridge Middle School putting LED lights in their gym, which is a picture that you see right there. Next slide, please. Henry Henry's team is managing these projects for us as out of the facility audit, but we still are involved to make sure that they if anything needs to be moved on the roof or shut down equipment, et cetera. So Academy Endeavor, Explore Elementary School, Mountain View Elementary School, and Rampart High School. Next slide, please. Uh, life safety issues, public address and fire alarm modifications at Mountain View Elementary School, the Da Vinci Academy, and Aspen Valley High School. Next slide, please. Uh, the door hardware modifications, sometimes we refer to this as the Columbine locks. And as we progress and move through this, Brian Grady's team identifies some areas. Some of the site administrators go, hey, this, this isn't working how we first did it. So we're going back and making changes. So at Challenger Middle School, originally we just put locks, changed the, the locks of the Columbine locks at the uh, it was it was just for the offices in the library, so we now are going to go back and convert the main doors to the library. And then at the EAC, the uh, preschool is getting some modifications to their doors. Next slide, please. Some hydration stations. Some of these are green grant funds and also general fund, but we help out the schools. And so a popular one has been hydration stations. So Frontier and Ranch Creek Elementary School have requested those and they're getting put in. Next slide, please. And this is more, you know, doesn't seem like a big deal, but it can be a big deal, but stage curtain cleaning and fire treatment. And so we're doing these three schools this year, Prairie Hills, Timberview, and Woodman Roberts. Next slide, please. We're replacing the two portables at Academy International with two new ones. They'll look like the, the picture that you see is the one from Mountain View Elementary School. They'll be almost identical to that. Next slide, please. So out at Edith Wolford, wastewater upgrade. So anytime you deal with regulatory agencies and water treatment, we have a well out there, but then how do we treat the wastewater? And so the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment has made changes. So we've hired an engineering firm and we're currently working with them to upgrade our wastewater treatment plant that is out at Edith Wolford. In addition to that, Unfortunately, as part of the Black Forest fire, there's not as many live trees out there on the adjacent property, and so we're getting a lot of water runoff that is encroaching onto our property. So we're rebuilding a retaining wall to help mitigate and then push the water out onto Black Forest Road. And then we're doing a VAV upgrade, and this is similar, tied into the direct digital controls. And what that is, is a variable air volume system. So you might have four spaces that have one VAV box that controls the air just to those spaces is what that means. Next slide, please. At Timberview Middle School, we're going to replace the north door. That's what that means is that's the storefront and the doors that go with it. The, over the years, the salt from ice melt has pretty much rotted the doors away. It's hard to secure. Um, when the Turf field was put in, they put in the long jump pits, but they did not put a drain in there. And so it becomes really soupy in the springtime for the kids to jump in there. So 
with the additional work at the bond with the contractor they're hired they are actually going to come over just for material costs and provide labor and they're going to put drains in those long jump pits for us at timberview and then just in that timberview is doing some tree planting next slide please some sites so, uh, excuse me site specific projects challenger middle school we have to replace a section of our sewer line actually we're going to just reline it so we don't have to dig the entire site up what they do is they shoot with hot water like a sleeve inside of it and then it pushes up to the old pipe and then seals it and also saves about a hundred thousand dollars to do it that way um, discovery canyon high school they're doing a project lead the way classroom modifications when discovery canyon was first built the classroom that they want to use for project lead the way was not designed or the use was not for what it is so there has to be some modifications to change the lights out the electrical put in dust collection system um, liberty high school we put in two gym dividers the da vinci academy they were building a quiet room and then at facilities we're doing fence and gate modifications next slide please and kind of to piggyback on what mr gregory was talking about where the money comes from and the funding and we use the capital reserve we also try to plan out for future projects to kind of know what it's going to cost and so these projects the engineering is being completed or has been completed on these projects so air academy high school building c boiler replacement pine creek high school and mountain ridge middle school rooftop unit replacement rooftop units are the air handlers sometimes depending on the system they have the heating and cooling in them um, at the eac the cooling plant replacement what that is is the chiller plant the cooling that's provided there and then EAC, the electrical system upgrade, those of you that have been around a few years, remember when you had your board meeting with the lanterns. And so we're doing the engineering on that so we can eventually replace the electrical system at the EAC. And lastly, we're doing engineering for fire alarm at facilities and electrical service upgrade at the facilities. Next slide, please. And like anything else, every summer, we get we try to stay up on stay on top of inspections and everything else that has to go on this year is a little more unique with the COVID-19 items that have to happen so we're looking at sneeze guards we're trying to help write procedures for how things are going to work when the schools open up in addition to that our grounds people are doing field maintenance and then you see all the other inspections that go on elevator generator black backflow kitchen hood inspections and cleaning, fire extinguishers, fire doors, therapy swings, basketball goals, climbing walls, rope courses, stage rigging, and then fire systems. So there's a lot of work that goes on. Next slide, please. And all of it gets done by the people that make it happen. You know, the great, great group of people, customer services on the forefront. I would like to really give a shout out also to our project manager, Dan Munn. Who does a lot of work to accomplish this stuff he's very frugal his his kids go to school in the district he takes great pride in the things that he does in the district so he's a great asset to us so with that next slide do you have any questions for me well thank you mr lund mr tempe do you have any questions uh no questions just great report bob that's a tremendous amount of work uh done by by the crew so um, kudos to them and uh, thank you for that comprehensive report. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lundberg. That's a humbling report. I mean, you, you go over that stuff and you think, oh my gosh, that's a lot of stuff. And it really is. We are such a large school district. I mean, you never would think of like the stage curtain cleaning or and fire treatment or the grease trap maintenance or the elevator checking. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It's 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 shocking, the stuff that we do. It's very impressive. Uh, I've got a question for you. The last slide with all the folks on it. Where was that taken? So actually, we haven't had a chance with the pandemic to get a new picture, but that was taken up at DCC down, I believe, outside of the middle school cafeteria. Oh my gosh, that's and a I think cool that was picture. Two. It was two years ago. It could have been three years ago. So. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yep, thank you. 
Mrs. Conninger. Hey, Bob. With um, having worked with Henry White, Wright Wiesner for so long, I can appreciate people that have that kind of mind that can follow that many projects at once. And um, <clears throat> I'm grateful. And I just also wanted to say how grateful I am to your custodial staff. I worked very closely with many of them in the different schools my kids have been in. And I just think they're a huge piece to um, how well we can, you know, how well we treat our students in the schools. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Mr. LaValle. <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Lund. Yeah, I, it's just amazing, um, like others have said, how much you all do. You do great work and I, I so appreciate it. Please pass on at least my my appreciation for what you do. The only comment I had, I you mentioned green grants to provide for hydration stations. I thought we were getting rid of those green grants for this year due to budget constraints, may, but I may be wrong. So you're, you are correct. But this was this money for this. Our money doesn't end until June thirtieth. That so answers. It. All right. Yep. That that was my that was my hunch, but I wasn't sure. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Colonel Harding. Yeah. Thanks, Bob, for a great report. And yes, it, yes, as uh, Mr. Lundberg mentioned, it is a ton of work, and it only gets more every year as we add uh, add facilities and add real property and what we do have ages. Um, as a side note on slide 22, and, and Mr. Lundberg, you mentioned the grease trap maintenance too. I would highly recommend the board members attend uh, when the grease trap maintenance occurs. I, I will be busy that day, but I would encourage you guys to, to go have I'll a I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be there in spirit. I'm with Tom. And bring a clothespin for your nose. Yeah. Uh, I, I saw your mute button come back on, Mr. Harding, so you must be done, or Colonel Harding, so you're done. And I will tell you that um, I appreciate your suggestion for a gr good time, but I won't be there either. Uh, Mr. Lund, thank you so much. Um, you know, staff and students need to go to a place every day that's um, well kept and, and put together so that they can be proud of where they go and, and you and your team help that happen. So thank you so much for this good report and the work that you do. Thank you. We are going to now move on to 7H, and that is a changes to administrative policies update. Yes, I will have Ms. Ms. Thompson address this one. Good evening, board, and thank you, Mr. Gregory. Um, as the board has requested in the past, uh, periodic updates to our policy changes, uh, the board wishes to be informed of those. And so I just wanted to bring to your attention um, this document that gives you the policy updates that have been made throughout the school year. So if, if you notice on your report, the large majority of policy updates were done on July 1st of 2019. That is our typical district policy update cycle. However, um, with changes to law and changes um, to different uh, procedures, it necessitates some mid-year policy updates, and that's really um, what I would like to bring your attention to within this report. There's very few of those that have been made um, for example, DVD was just recently updated to add language regarding emergency funds. DJ and DJA are procurement policies, and those parameters changed, and those policies were updated mid-year to align with new federal limits, as were the procedures that support that policy. The only other policy that I'll bring your attention to as well are the GBECR, Alcohol and Drug Free Workplace Procedures. That language was updated after the July 1, 2019 updates um, to insert language regarding new compliances and post-incident tests and alcohol concentration levels that needed to be um, disclosed to our employees. In, in our policy. So that really concludes the mid-year policy updates and uh, you may expect another report first semester with all of the updates 
that will be coming on July 1 of 2020. May I answer any questions for our board this evening? Thank you, Mrs. Thompson, and I'm going to go to Mr. Tempe. No questions. Thank you. Thank you, and Mr. Lundberg. No questions. Thank you. Mrs. Conninger. Also no questions. Mr. Lavalley. Uh, thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Somebody's got to ask a question. Just a quick one. I was wondering <laughs> about the, the new the new policy that's uh, teacher displacement. It was a uh, golf Charlie Kilo Alpha Alpha. I'm just wondering, it seemed like a reasonable policy. Um, I'm just wondering if it's if there's been any pushback or anything like that from that policy and if we've used it. I am not aware of any adverse uh, input to that particular policy. Um, a G policy is an employee, usually a, a HR related um, personnel policy. And so um, unless Dr. Peak would like to add any commentary to that, I don't believe we've had any adverse input or commentary shared with my department on it. No, that's uh, that's correct, Ms. Thompson and Mr. Lavalley. We really wanted just to make sure that we had appropriate language for teacher displacement. It is a policy that is um, uh, utilized in, in districts throughout uh, Colorado as a point of reference. We have not, however, initiated that or been in a place uh, to necessitate initi initiating that. It really speaks to uh, having to move a non-probationary teacher from his or her assigned school. Uh, and we we do a lot of different things for staffing of schools to have them appropriately balanced given student enrollment. Uh, it has not necessitated needing this action to take place, but this is consistent with uh, guidance from CASB and it's consistent with state statute. So we do want to make sure that we have it um, as part of our administrative policies. And I would just like to add to that that there was case law that was settled last spring, um, the Johnson and the Masters cases, both out of Denver Public Schools, but reviewed by uh, the Court of Appeals and the Colorado Supreme Court that indicated um, what steps districts needed to take in order to comply with law when dealing with these types of decisions and so that was another piece of new information that uplifted the need for us to, to have policy in place in advance uh, okay thanks miss thompson and uh, dr peak yeah and like I say it just made it made sense what what you said what you had had come up with i was just curious it sounds like we haven't used it that's very good no other questions thank you thank you mr lavalley colonel harding no questions here. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Harding and Mrs. Thompson. I know the time that goes into the review of administrative policies and I appreciate um, the continual review of these to keep them alive and accurate. So thank you for your work on this this evening and all semester, all year. Thank you. Well, thank you. I wish I could have provided you with a much more engaging presentation, especially coming after Mr. Lund. So um, next time I'll just have to reserve my place ahead of his beautiful pictures <laughs> that makes his presentation uh, that much more engaging. So thank you, board. You bet. Thank you. I, I, I frankly was riveted and I'm sure the rest of the board was as well. So thank you, Mrs. Thompson. OK, I'm going to move to an agenda item 7i. You're not seeing that on a public view because it is an expulsion report for spring semester 2020 and it is state law um, CRS 2472243D3. The public records law requires the Board of Education to comply with provisions of the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, which protects the confidentiality of student discipline records. Therefore, the report by the superintendent on student expulsions is confidential. And now we will move on to item 8A, which is building fund update. Um, I would like to invite executive director for building fund to present Mr. Henry. Right. Good evening board. Just wanted to make sure I had a microphone check. We can hear you. Thank you. Uh, um, it's a 
it's summer, but certainly not as busy as we've been in the past. So the breakneck speed that you've experienced is a little bit more calm, but we are wrapping up a lot as we begin here in June and we'll be ready for a school start. Next slide, please. I've broken these into the categories. This one's remodels and additions. Next slide. The Rock Rimmon School, you can see some of the finishing touches here. We've got the exterior door and windows and roof and all the pieces are coming together. Uh, next slide. We've um, called out for all of the final inspections uh, for the fire department, electrical department, building department, all the pieces. What you're looking at in the upper left hand corner is the new front entry vestibule. At the back of that window is the old exterior doorway which represents in the lower right hand corner so in the lower right hand corner you're standing in the old school looking out that new vestibule area because the doors are all propped open and then the other pictures are turning to the west this is the new uh, area where the uh, um, transaction window will be and you can see the furniture is starting to come into place uh, as we're finishing up these pictures from a week and a half ago um, we're at the substantial completion timeline punch lists, inspections, all those pieces. Next slide. Here you see some more of the interior finishes, uh, the bathrooms from a few weeks ago and the uh, plumbing fixtures, like I mentioned, the furniture. So we've been focusing in on a lot of the controls. So the entry controls, the um, buzz in systems, the security uh, life safety pieces are all being finalized as we now have furniture in the uh, proper locations. Uh, the school has moved out of their old office and they're moving into this new office space as we're uh, working in their occupancy, uh, working on the direct digital controls. I'll talk about that in a moment, but we've incorporated all of the facilities departments, technical specs into this new addition and remodel. Next slide. So this summary, you can read the, uh, the, the subjects I have there identified. Next slide. For post occupancy. So this refers to projects that we've done a while ago and we needed to wrap them up for school start last year. The upper two pictures, for example, are Chinook Trail Middle School. The lower two pictures are the Legacy Peak Elementary School. The upper pictures are a um, hoist for a wrestling mat. They didn't have a wrestling program the first year at Chinook Trail Middle School, so we have the hoist in place now because they'll have that this year. And then there's that backsplash, which is the rear wall of that art room added at the Chinook Trail Middle School that we just finished up this past spring. At uh, the Legacy Peak Elementary School, uh, initially we did not um, place stage lighting, but you can see both on the stage and from the gymnasium side, um, some of those lights that we've just recently added and did the owner training this week for the uh, um, teachers at the site. Next slide. You heard a lot of these summaries earlier from Bob Lund of the life safety, fire alarm systems, the public address systems, the direct digital controls, uh, handling those hot and cold uh, calls that come in from di uh, different schools and the next year a door replacement. So these, this, there weren't any pretty pictures uh, but at least it describes those components that uh, how close Bob's team and my team are on making sure we uh, get plans in place of his expectations. These are the ones that are financed through the facility audit accounts. They get installed. Sometimes his project manager or his uh, uh, facilities um, uh, supervisors and technicians do the work and sometimes we do it. So there's a, a sharing of responsibilities, but at the end of the day, the benefit is this school district. Um, yeah, next slide. The other facility audit types of projects that Bob was mentioning are roofs. This one is Rampart. Um, Rampart is uh, over 50% of the new, so this is the insulation. The pictures you're looking at is the rigid insulation going on top of the existing roof as an overlay. And you can see in the right hand picture, they're actually rolling that fabric over top of that. Um, new roof. So they're about 50% of the way done in that area of Rampart. Um, there's been a lot of coordination of cellular antennas and conduits. So um, Bob mentioned that uh, we have to make sure the mechanical units coordination is there, but in this case, 
you can see in the upper left hand corner, the antennas there. So uh, we need to make sure the um, cellular antenna provider knows we're um, on their on the roof that has to be moved out of the way, put back and uh, realigned. So there's a lot of coordination and, and this same roofer uh, is doing thorough investigations of the electrical conduits that run underneath the roof deck to make sure as they screw down the new insulation, you can see those holes, that they're not drilling through electrical conduits. So they, they've done a thorough job to uh, ensure the uh, continuity of our systems in place. Um, the, at Rampart, there was a lot of coordination as we were mobilizing and delivering materials and removing the old gravel on top it was occurring right around the same time the students were coming back to school to drop off their uh, final books and pick up their contents of their lockers. So we had student safety as the number one paramount as that was happening. So we'll be done with this one here this summer, probably later in July. Next slide. These two show the Explore and Academy Endeavor. Um, there's different benefits for the color of the roof material, black and white. Um, so there's two different roof types as, as we finished up those. Uh, the overlays, the manufacturer will come out and inspect those. Um, in the uh, start our warranty process if we get those new roofs. There'll be more facility audits because uh, a lion's share of our issuance 2B, which is now in issuance uh, 2 and 3, um, there's $12 million more of facility audits. So we'll get more of these kinds of reports in the future. Next slide. We're getting into the fairness formula. So this is school sponsored, um, um, focused, wrapping up all those projects. Um, several pictures. Um, we talked about hydration stations with the green grant. In this case, here's a, a picture of a hydration sta station installed and financed. Uh, new plumbing lines put in at an elementary school. The other two pictures on the right are flooring projects, a new floor in the lower right hand corner, and the existing floor furniture moved out uh, where it will be removed and installed over this summer. So you'll see more progress of those. Um, just a reminder as the go ahead and do the next slide. Um, as we uh, are finishing up Fairness Formula, all those funds finished, but there's a lot of Fs there. In the um, this current um, financial year um, through June, come July 1st, all the Fairness Formula funds are complete and any additional funds would be turned back over to the school board. So all the schools and um, project managers, everybody knows that timeline. Um, several pictures, I've shared some of these in the past, but here's some progress in the upper left-hand corner sound panel and light panels at an elementary school, uh, dimmer and amplifier components. In the center is a uh, um, security camera that was added in a playground area. Um, you see the uh, security light, I'm sorry, there. And then in the right hand pictures, new band room, music room lights added. You can see their LED, the new energy efficient, um, tore out the old ones. And then the lower left hand corner is a um, ADA door operator for student entry. Uh, next slide. The last two images of Fairness Formula for today are at uh, a new furniture. So you get, you'll see a lot more of these kind of pictures here in the next few. All right, next slide. This is a, um, uh, a list of the way the projects are grouped together. We've spent 75% um, of the funds to date. We're only at the 25% of the funds still remaining. Um, so the list of what you're seeing here in front of you um, is a, a small roadmap. It's uh, easy to see the components. I'll draw your, uh, and I've got several pictures coming up on many of these, but the ones that do not have pictures are the ones we haven't touched yet. So here's a verbal summary of um, uh, from this one slide. You can see the Air Academy High School Stadium. You can see the District 20 Stadium Phase 2 and Pine Creek High School Stadium Phase 2 team rooms. Those projects haven't started yet because that happens later. That'll be a 2021 timeline, as well as the pool at Pine Creek High School. So uh, the Pine Creek Stadium and the pool at Pine Creek, those um, were out to bid, awarded, but we're into the um, pre-construction budget scheduling world. We'll bring those um, information back to you for all those stadium projects because that's getting into um, uh, the next wave, but not happening this summer. Um, you'll see in just a moment the phase one work, the turf and track work and the tennis work. Those I'll be talking about in just a moment. Um, and also I'll touch uh, again 
the uh, elementary 21, I'll get to that, and then you can see the words facility audit. So next slide. Images of some high school grounds projects. I won't go into a lot of detail, but working closely with Bob Lund's team and the schools of happening work over the summer. Next slide, please. Um, at Pine Creek, we've removed the existing turf and the existing running track. Um, those projects are um, deep into construction. We're done some geotechnical samples. This is the soils to make sure uh, the drainage system works and what topsoil materials would need to be installed. Uh, we're receiving final drawings and the schedule is to finish these up as soon as possible before the fall semester starts at the school. The contractors that we've hired for this um, school for the turf and track at um, this one and uh, at another school um, are doing other projects across the nation. So it's a matter of us getting in there to finish up the work. But we're very confident this work is going to uh, finish up in time. And then, as I mentioned, the uh, Pine Creek Stadium would be a future phase, phase two, um, looking at summer 2021. Uh, next slide, please. Here's the current series of tennis courts. You may remember last year we did the Rampart tennis courts. So if you uh, think back, we've removed the existing tennis courts and this picture shows that uh, uh, components that are gone. We have more equipment mobilized to the site and now spreading on the additional soils on top to support the PT or the post-tension concrete. Uh, last time we had 39 concrete trucks uh, lined up at Rampart. So expect that to be happening here in the near future. Um, but as you also might remember, there's a 28 day cure period. So it's a lot of busyness and there's a lot of waiting and then they finish it up with all the fence posts and all the rest. So this, uh, the tennis courts at Liberty to be done for this uh, school start this fall. Also doing tennis court work at both um, Air Academy High School and at the Discovery Canyon. So again, future pictures will be bringing those. Next slide, please. Um, Elementary 21, more of a placeholder. So this is now the new construction. Next slide, please. Here is a uh, pretty picture of the um, Submittal to the City of Colorado Springs uh, planning. It shows the um, green is the outdoorsy, of course. The gray in the middle is the footprint of the school. So let me walk you through. The daydreamer is the street along the bottom. The road along the left reads Thunder Mountain. So Pine Creek High School is four blocks to the lower left of this image. This is an aerial uh, image. The front door is directly in the middle. You can see that white sidewalk from the lower left hand corner up towards the middle of the building. That's the front door. I'll show you a picture in just a minute. So the gray zone in the middle where all those straight hatches are is the main parking lot. And then the gray components on the left are service drives for um, the bus and for the preschool areas. Um, the upper right hand corner shows the playgrounds and then the lower right hand corner that green box is the outdoor play field. Um, uh, all the submittals are going just fine for um, the development plan, for um, uh, platting, indeed, the dedication, all those components. Um, uh, yeah, the, I'll get into that in just a minute. So utilities are in place and um, we'll have a street address within the week of what that um, building will be named. Um, next slide, please. So here's some color graphics of the exterior of the building. We've had several color and materials meetings. Again, working with the facilities department on durable materials, how it uh, appears, working with the developer of getting their uh, input that it uh, is contextual within their neighborhood. Um, the uh, top picture is uh, walking up towards the front door. The lower right hand corner is the extension of the cafeteria, so the outdoor play. And you can see the color selections that we've uh, come up with with a color palette. We actually have met with the um, planning principal and other staff to come up with the interior palette as well. So we, we now have a um, uh, all the components that meet that durable um, components. Um, I'll, I'll mention as you please go to the next slide. As we look at the next slide, um, we heard from Bob Lund. So go ahead, next slide. Thank you. Uh, we heard from Bob Lund about the 
vinyl wall covering and exterior wall ceiling. So we've done a lot of lessons learned on the exterior walls of all bond funded projects. We do not put vinyl wall covering. Bob's in the process of removing vinyl wall covering of exterior walls, interior surfaces there. So that's a, uh, an example of uh, not repeating the same mistake uh, from 15, 20 years ago. Um, these images from the upper left hand corner is walking in the front door, going down the main hallway. On the right hand side is the library. Further down that same hallway on the right picture is that cafeteria and stage. Um, and then the lower left hand corner is probably the biggest sales pitch. And eh, it's not the right way to say it, but the, the right area of the way the floor plan was uh, um, built around that learning area, that uh, breakout area for all those student pods. You can see uh, three of the five spaces in this image of how those um, classrooms uh, collaborate, use that. If you, it is um, an improvement from the Legacy Peak Elementary School, but more of a blend of the Chinook Trail Middle School, how we've got these breakout areas feeding into those classrooms. Uh, next slide, please. Here are real time pictures from a week and a half ago where the um, water trucks keep the soils da um, dust down and the um, overlot grading. So the pictures from this week are all the topsoil uh, overlot mass excavation is started and we've been working very closely with the developer who um, essentially needed our land and we need, uh, needed our soils. We need to get rid of our soils. So there's a um, collaborative understanding that it's a lot less expensive for us to have that earthwork moved next door than it is to put on trucks and drive it miles away. So cost saving measures there, um, but also the benefit of the timing. Uh, you can think back from several years ago. Here it is middle of June and we're doing all the soils work. Uh, middle of June several years ago at Legacy Peak, we were just building roads getting into the site. So here all the roads are built. So a lot of uh, pre planning in place from uh, folks uh, before myself. So my point is, is that the developer already had their stormwater and erosion control protection um, permits in place by us having them pull the land off our land and move it, uh, off the soils off of our land and move it onto their land. It's the same erosion control permit, whereas we cannot open up our permit until we get all the um, documents in place and we actually own the land. So there's been a lot of coordination between all the entities. Next slide, please. Additional projects. Um, there are a lot of life safety issues of fire alarms, cameras, safety, security, um, but not a lot of pretty pictures in today's, but you can see from the summary of other projects. So next slide. Additional projects. So the sig most significant additional project we've begun is the Village High School. Um, from several meetings ago, you've approved the abatement and you've approved the purchase of this. What you're looking at in the upper left hand corner is the scaffolding that was put into place and working closely with the developer, uh, working closely with the general contractor and the abatement contractor is that they use this scaffolding and I'll show you a picture in just a moment, but they use this scaffolding to remove the asbestos up in the ceiling area but that scaffolding is still in place for us to use for the ductwork and lighting and all the rest of it. So a lot of coordination between entities. So we don't have to disassemble these scaffolding and build new scaffolding back in. Uh, the lower right, uh, so the lower picture and the upper right hand corner pictures is um, images showing the demolition from a week and a half ago of the, the lower areas. Uh, having been at that job site just today, it looks so much different and it's coming along very well. Uh, next slide. We have what's called air clearances. So this is pictures from within the containment. So the abatement contractor that we hired and the um, third party inspector, this is their picture taken through their um, spacesuit of sorts of the bagging up that is bestest up in the ceiling area. So you see all the plastic and the red tapes and all the rest. So all those are down, um, safe to walk in. Um, demolition was occurring in the lower level while um, uh, abatement was happening in the upper level. So a lot of coordination. Um, currently, duct work, uh, rough in, plumbing, electrical, rough in, um, conversations of stormwater, fiber, all of those uh, components are happening uh, as we speak for a, a 
fall opening. So in this case, the fall opening is in the, the uh, month of September, uh, not for August school start, but everybody is well aware of that timeline. So it's a tight schedule, tight budget, and we're able to meet those. Next slide, please. Here's some additional pretty pictures from the architect showing that space and on next series of pictures we'll show the scaffolding down in some of those finished pieces. Next slide. Internal connections. So the three schools on the left, I now have pictures of those, but they were starting them. Uh, Ram Rampart will be done in early July, the wiring. Eagle View will be done in early July and Academy Endeavor is actually complete at this time. So all those projects were in the works. Three other projects that were scheduled for 2021 have been advanced because of uh, being able to start summer projects in the spring and uh, just needing to mobilize. So you'll see more pictures of those as we move forward. Um, additional technology infrastructure projects include the ERP or the Enterprise Resource Planning. This is the HR department with the recruiting and performance and the adaptive insights with the budget. Again, not a lot of pretty pictures, but um, a lot of work still happening behind the scenes. OK, the last slide, please. Here's the pre-construction mobilization pictures from the Classical Academy. So they've removed all of their pieces and on the north end of their north campus there'll be future additions for the um, music program on one end and the athletic program on the other end so this is a reference point of what you'll see next slide final slide as i wrap up i just want to put out some components that our technical specification has been a, a, a great tool to use with all the general contractors um, we have a new accountant. I mentioned that last time I presented with you all, but I also just received a resignation from a project manager. So our, our staff of 10, we're going to be down to nine. I'm not going to rehire that project manager because our workload is starting to wind down a little bit. So yes, it's a busy summer, but we'll be able to absorb that as we head into the next few years. Um, our Citizens Bond Oversight Committee will be doing a tour and meeting in July. So some of you will be part of that and then we'll be doing reports for the financials in the month of uh, June 15th, uh, uh, May 15th reports, and there'll be an update to the school board in your one meeting in July. With that, I turn it over if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rex. Mr. Mr. Timmy. Uh, thank you, thank Henry. You, Henry. I think we've got a little, a little feedback, feedback here. here. Yeah, let's just make sure we're all muted, please. please. I think back to five years ago when um, I was on the Growth and Capital Needs Committee, co-facilitated by Mrs. Reynolds and Mr. Gregory uh, in different roles. And then fast forward a year later, um, having my arm twisted to get involved in the bond campaign. Uh, this, this really uh, illuminates one thing. I shudder to think where this district would be without the infusion of $230 million of bond money. Uh, and thankfully, we've got a very supportive uh, group of parents and voters in this district. But uh, it's just amazing to tangibly see what's happened um, since uh, November of 2016. So uh, Henry, kudos to, to you, your team, uh, everybody in the district who has been working very hard on this uh, building fund and obviously complementing it with other capital monies and um, uh, audit money and all, but uh, it's just really gratifying to see. We, we live in a great district and I've just got tremendous gratitude um, to, to live in this district. So that's all. Well, well stated. Mr. Lundberg. Mr. Timmy was right. Uh, without the approval from our patrons for the bond issuance, that's wow. We would be in really rough shape. I, I don't have any questions. I, I'm almost intimidated to ask questions <laughs> after looking at that. That is a fantastic conglomeration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mrs. Conninger. Hey, Henry. Um, I was just one thing and you probably said it but what is the year for the is it next summer or next fall not this coming one but the following 
that the 21 will be ready, the elementary 21? Henry? Henry, you might be muted. I mean, you are muted if you're talking. I'm, I, I'm now unmuted. Hey, um, 14 months from now, so uh, yeah. before August 2021. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, and I agree with everybody else. I am in awe of um, how much is always going on in your life, and I appreciate all the work, and I also appreciate the the voters who approved the 230 because I think that's been so um, beneficial, obviously, to our, our school district. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cloninger. Mr. Lavalley. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Wright Wiesner. Um, I, I used to ask, actually, it was I would ask Heather in her different role if, if uh, as part, as the head of the CBOC, if if the money being spent, if she felt like it was being spent frugally and, and appropriately. And now that I go to the CBOC meetings, I, I can hear that for myself and I can hear your briefings. And I, I do believe that we are spending our money appropriately, frugally and, and, and well spent. So it's a very nice brief. I look forward to our July 11th um, tour um, uh, to see many of these buildings. My only question, I, just, I looked at the at the new at the village, their new digs, and I'm thinking, man, is this really going to be ready in the fall? But I, I assume it's going to be right. I have <laughs> I'm, I'm heavily involved in that project. And yes, it will be open for that. We, yes, there's oh, a lot more to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. No further questions. Great, great work. Thank, thank you, Colonel Harding. Always fun to see progress. No questions. Thanks, Henry. Thank you, Colonel Harding. Uh, I have what, one question as you were presenting, uh, Henry, and that was, um, so did did the fact that we didn't have students and staff in buildings this spring help or hinder progress um, with this COVID? I'm, I'm just curious because you, you're busy. Um, yeah. I, I'm going to say it two different ways. So yes, it hindered because we weren't able to ramp up to the full staffing we would normally do over a summer because contracts were um, assigned and other priorities of contractors, subcontractors, suppliers, all those long lead items were still scheduled for the June, July timeline. So that piece was oh, sure. we were able to advance some, but in every opportunity where we were able to advance projects, we took full advantage of that. So uh, it's a mixed bag. Um, um, I, I, I don't wish <laughs> this spring on anyone ever again. And if we have a trouble in the future, um, most of our projects are outdoor projects. If you think of that, it's tennis courts and turf and track and um, stadium, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. So it doesn't affect schools. Um, mm -hmm. The village will be complete. The elementary 21 is a standalone building. And then all the other uh, below the line projects uh, will have their own life of their own. So um, it, it's been yeah, we're busy, but uh, not not as crazy. I I've, I appreciate the uh, uh, the more focused attention on actual um, problem solving rather than crisis management. <laughs> That's a great distinction. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Wiesner, and thank you for an excellent report. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, we are now going to move on to agenda item nine A. And that is the 2020-2021 Board of Education meeting calendar review. And this is simply a meeting calendar review. Um, nothing more than that. And that is, I'm gonna wait for one second for it to come up. I know you have uh, so much there to bring up. My goodness, um, good job. Uh, we, we approved these, I wanna say in February already, it's just simply a reminder of the meeting dates that we have set for the 2020-2021 school year. And that begins with July's board meeting, July 23rd. As you know, we always have just one board meeting in July and um, that will begin at six o'clock. Um, really at six o'clock, as I mentioned earlier, we will not start at 5.30 with a dinner. Um, we will begin each meeting at six o'clock until we have students back. Um, the other only other thing to remind perhaps even the community about who still are with us and there's appears to be 10 of you um, our next the only other meeting of the year that we have um, one only is in December and both of those are designed to allow staff members and board members to get a little bit of a vacation um, in those two months. So those items 
um, need to be on your agendas and your calendars. I imagine they probably already are board members, but it's simply a reminder. And we did vote on this and it's moving forward. Any comments or questions on this? I won't go through the round robin. Please speak up if you have any. I had a feeling that's what you'd say. So um, we'll move on to the next agenda item. And that agenda item is simply a debrief. And I'm going to, before we actually debrief with our final closing statement, I would like to wish happy birthday greetings to two folks on our board, Mr. Tom LaValley, who has a birthday on July 7th, and Colonel Troy Harding, a birthday on July 13th. Happy birthday to you all, both. And by the way, if we had been in a on land meeting tonight, we would be singing. So I know you're going to miss that, and I imagine the rest of cabinet's pleased that they're not singing. But happy well, birthday! We're, to we're hoping that you would. Yeah, it isn't going to happen, Mr. Lundberg. But you can. Oh, uh, thank you. Next time. Oh, okay. All right. So thank you, and and thank you for your service, Tom and Troy, and and have great birthdays. Okay, was our business this evening focused on activities that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements, and our global end statement that reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for successful transition to the next level and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success. Hearing nothing to the contrary, I'm going to take that as a yes, and I need to let you know that we will I'll be moving into an executive session this evening. Um, we need a motion to move to executive session per CRS 246-4024B to confer with legal counsel for the purpose of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger. Aye. Mr. LaValley. Aye. Mr. Lundberg. Aye. Mrs. Reynolds. Aye. Mr. Tumby. Aye. Thank you. Invited to this executive session are the board, Colonel Harding, Mr. Gregory, Ms. Thompson, Mr. Cohn, and Shelley Kuzer, who will join us for the purpose of technical support. This executive session will be held in Microsoft Teams this evening. And so what that means, board, is that you will go to your calendar and click on that, and we will join into executive session in about five minutes. I will adjourn the meeting following the executive session. So thank you all for being here with us this evening, and we hope to see you on land in July 23rd. Okay, let's move on to executive session.